Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Global Connections Television is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of a media outlet, be it PBS, a community access television, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you like our shows, please feel free to download them. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at how we prepare for the 21st century. How do we plan? How do we move forward? And maybe not in the way we did in the past. And my guest <laughs> is an expert in this area. My guest is Mr. Rick Smyer. Rick is the founder and CEO of Communities of the Future, commonly called COTF. He's an internationally recognized futurist specializing in the, agents, the uh, areas of building capacities for transformation in local communities. He's also the co-author of an excellent book. It's titled Preparing for a World that Doesn't Exist Yet, Framing a Second Enlightenment to Create Communities of the Future. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at this. A very interesting book. Rick Smart, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Yes, this is yeah. a second run. Yes, it in is. fact, I was going to, our, our viewers, we won't be able to get into your book in great detail, but they can so. go back on our website at globalconnectionstelevision.com in the video gallery and go down about two years ago and they'll get an in-depth overview of this book, but it's an excellent book. But in a sentence or so, what, what was the book about? Bill, the book's about the fact that we believe, it's our opinion, and there are no experts for the future in terms of what we've experienced in uh -huh. our opinion. Uh, a way to look at the future that is different than just trying to make the old ideas, old institutional structures uh, more efficient. We believe that there's a whole new civilization. My good friend, Dr. John Cobb out in California, who uh, coined the term ecological civilization, <coughs> believes that we're in the process of developing a whole new way of looking at the future and are preparing for it in a different way. And so what we're interested in is what we call building capacities mm -hmm. for this transformation that we believe is going on. And uh, we're mm -hmm. connecting all kinds of different people to try to, in effect, together ask appropriate questions, try to define what it is we need to do, and move forward in a way that tests out new ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing through the Communities of the Future that's correct. project. Now, the, the Kaufman Foundation is very well known as, as in the futurist right. areas. What, what is the Kaufman Foundation, and how are you networking with them? Well, it's, it's a $3 billion <laughs> foundation out in Kansas City that has mm -hmm. been focused on entrepreneurship and education. And they set up a unique division about two years ago with the idea in mind that we were in the process of shifting to new organizational principles, mm -hmm. like from hierarchies to, in mm -hmm. their case, ecosystems. And there's a reason for that, because hierarchies have to, in effect, be changed in a standardized way. Mm -hmm. Ecosystems based on biological principles connect with each other and just emerge in ways that continuously evolve. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very much difference in how you lead, what it is that needs to be thought about, how do you prepare for education for those kind, that kind of society. And so Kaufman's taking the lead of this, and they have five people that they've hired to be involved with thinking about how do we prepare for a different kind of future and why they're so interested in our work. Mm -hmm. Now business, the business community, corporations, mm -hmm. what have you, they, years ago, they were into that hierarchical arrangement. Right. You had a very structured situation there, yeah. but then they moved, they're moving more into a collegial type of arrangement into some of what you're talking about with the ecosystems. There's some kind of a parallel between those two or are they just totally separate? You know, it's interesting you should ask that question because you, I'm from the generation that looks for the one answer, the mm -hmm. best practice, the right. one thing that needs sure. to be done. And so one of the things that is different is to look and think about, well, what are the new connections? What's emerging? Mm -hmm. what, what is the developing that are specific to the way in which we need to prepare for a different kind of future? So the business community, and I was a CEO in the textile industry as an example, and let me use that, let me use that as an example. You go back 30 years, then there was the linear approach of one piece of equipment where you introduced bales of cotton that went to the next piece of equipment, next piece of equipment, and finally you had a yarn that came out after about seven different processes. 
what has happened in the last, even though that's still the case, what's happened in the last 15 years is a concept of a different type of manufacturing process. And we now call it 3D printing, but back in the 87 to 90 period, it was called rapid prototyping. And it was only in laboratories. And so as opposed to huge pieces of equipment, you now can download uh, a blueprint, you can, build, you can order substrate uh, from various different organizations worldwide. You have a printer, and so you print at home or you print in your, in your, uh, uh, in your business that which you need. Now, now, it's just started in the last 15 years, so it's just really in the early stages. But the whole concept of manufacturing is in and of itself transforming as well. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. We're seeing rapid transformation in many areas. Now, <clears throat> this uh, meta ecosystem that you're talking mm -hmm. about, uh, what, what are some of the characteristics of it? Uh, you've talked a little bit about what we can expect, but what, what exactly are we looking at? Well, the whole idea of the meta ecosystem, and, and meta is a short form for the, like metabolizing. In other mm -hmm. words, it's constantly emerging and constantly changing. Uh, and that's the whole idea of transformation. And so the th I think there are probably three key characteristics of a meadow ecosystem. One is it's taking inter interlocking networks, different types of networks mm -hmm. that are involved with looking for the way in which you build connections to create new ideas. Uh, a second characteristic and that, before, is, before please, we move uh -huh. off that, what, sure. what, what are some of the networks we're talking about? Well, I was going to give you examples. Yeah, I was going to give you an example of that. Uh, the fact, in fact, you and I and others are working on an idea. We call it uh, unleashing a 21st century narrative, mm -hmm. and it's 12 people that have their own projects, their own parallel processes, that understand that their core, two core principles that are involved with the future that are so important. One is the whole development and design and facilitating, seeding and facilitating of ecosystems so that they can emerge in very adaptable ways. And the second one is building capacities for this new kind of approach, transformation. Mm -hmm. give, you, give you two examples of this. Please. Specifically. Uh, uh, there's a woman up in, uh, lives in Massachusetts and her home office is in, is in Washington, D.C. And she said, Becky Corbin by name, and she said of the National Community College Association for Entrepreneurship. So her interest in this is in how do you, in effect, network entrepreneurs in community colleges across the country so they can become familiar with how do you get students to think about entrepreneurism in a different way, building networks of entrepreneurs as opposed to the individual that was an entrepreneur. It won't be one or the other, It'll be both in the future, but more and more we're shifting to the concept of networks of people that can help each other succeed and exactly. be co-creative as we call it together. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and you mentioned the 12 people that are involved in this. Right. And one thing, put a plug in for Global Connections Television, one thing that we will be doing in the future, and our viewers, if they're interested in this topic, can come back because we're gonna interview many of those folks that you are working with right now. You mentioned Dr. John Cobb, and we're working on an interview with him, so hopefully his will be on the website very soon. But I'm sorry, please go to the second point. No, 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 I want, let me, if I could, just, sure, I call it hitchhiking. There you go, <laughs> uh, on. on. what you just said, because one of, the, one of the ideas of the past is basically highly radically independent, right? That was the idea of the industrial age. Well, when you begin to have technologies, and notice my hands are coming closer and closer together, right. that create increasingly fast-paced, interdependent, interconnected, and complexity beyond which we've ever tried to deal with, then the old ideas don't work, the old methods. Mm -hmm. And we're all working in a new era, a research and development phase historically, I think, to see how we can help build new approaches to whether it be new approaches to manufacturing or new ideas of leadership or new concepts of the, we call it the creative molecular economy. And some people call it the gig economy. The main thing is it's an entrepreneurial type of economy and that's what Becky Corbin works on. Give you one more example of the 12 that we've got working together and collaborating mm -hmm. together. And his name is Albert Linderman up in Minneapolis. And Albert is somebody that's had the practical experience of working, for instance, in communities in South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, and other places. And he has an understanding that the need to build capacities of thinking about things differently and leads to actions that are different. And I always use this quote from a book called Smart World by a guy named Richard Ogles, about 10 years old. 
But he has this quote, and it's profound. And the quote in the book is that Western education is based on two fundamental principles. One, rationality, and two, knowledge that already exists, and therefore the guiding hand of learning looks backwards. That's where we talk about making things more efficient. <laughs> is the last part of this quote, which is so, so important, is that in an exponentially changing society and economy, the skills and understandings of intuition, insight, imagination, and innovation become key. And therefore, the guiding hand of learning looks forward so that we really have to think about, well, what's emerging? What are the new technologies? What are the new approaches to our own way we look at ourselves? Because we're moving into a whole new civilization that's not fully formed yet. That's very, very true. As you were talking, laying this out, Rick, it just uh, when you mentioned the gig economy, it just crossed my mind about artificial intelligence. We've been hearing a lot about AI, artificial intelligence, self-driving vehicles, that type of thing, robots replacing workers on the assembly line. How does artificial intelligence tie into this? If there were an area that's developing so rapidly at times, I'm not sure we really know how fast it's going. No, oh, I think you're right, Bill. And I can think back of the 30 years I've been involved with this type. Mm -hmm. And the one constant was things move faster than we thought they would. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons is, is what I was talking about. Everything's so tied together now. And if we really help each other succeed, then you shift and move faster. And that's why I think we're going to have to collaborate at a deeper level. Tying it into artificial intelligence, and your question, uh, Elon Musk is very much involved mm -hmm. with this, of course. With Tesla. It, Tesla, that's right, with automatic cars, automatically driving, self-driving cars and all. And I was listening to an interview that he had with the governors about six, eight months ago, and it was this concern. You could get this feeling in, his, in, his, in the way he introduced these uh, ideas of his concern of where the job's going to come from. I think that's one of the things you're exactly. getting at. Exactly. That's very true. The, the, the artificial intelligence and all other types of automation are actually, and accounting, they now have different types of software that can take the place of accountants, so certain types of accountants that do, do basic accounting work. So we're moving into an age where robotics, where the, the types of software, they're going to be able to, in effect, move at fast pace. IBM was working right now on a new technology and have been for five years that in real time updates itself and therefore the capacity of this software to be able to respond to new and emerging situations that humans would take time. It's a challenge. And so what's, what's the role of the human in the future? What's, where are the jobs going to come from? So a lot of these questions are just being asked, and that's another reason we need to think differently. We need to work with each other as opposed to looking backward for our answers. We need to try to anticipate what's emerging. And the whole concept of adaptable planning as opposed to strategic planning. Strategic planning came about with the oil companies that you probably know 40 and 50 years ago, in the 40s and 50s, I should say. And that, the two assumptions to strategic planning, one, that you can predict the outcome, and two, that you can control the process from where you are to where you want to go. <laughs> right. Well, I dare anybody tell me what's going to happen in 10 years, uh, you know, <laughs> much less 20. And so That's what we true. believe is you yeah. do both. We call it and both. That now strategic planning is about a three-year process. Mm -hmm. If you have a project to build a building, you use strategic planning. If you're thinking about creating something totally new in terms of how technologies interact with each other or new approaches to psychology or how you do new education, then you use adaptive planning that we're in the process with other, other groups and other people uh, to think about and to pioneer and to help collaborate together to think about, well, what does that mean and how do we go about doing it? Mm -hmm. Based upon your readings, mm -hmm. your knowledge of artificial intelligence, and again, <clears throat> predicting excuse me, what's going to happen is very difficult to do. We all know that. But based upon what you know now, as you look at AI and how rapidly it's coming online in so many different areas, mm -hmm. and we do know for a fact that many people are going to be displaced. There's no doubt about it. When you talk about driverless vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, there are 7 million truck drivers in the United States alone right. that if this thing ever comes online will be unemployed for all practical purposes. Now, the promoters of AI say, but you'll create new jobs. Very true. But the question is, will you create 7 million jobs to offset the truck drivers? How do you see that playing out? Well, I think that's a very important point because if you go back and look at the history of, of the evolution of economics and business and technology, every time there was an increase or a, a shift in a new technology, whether it be the automobile or electricity or whatever it was, that in the short run, 
you displace buggy whip. You know, people that make buggy whips. Buggy whip okay, industry, that's right. That's, a, that's, the, that's the one that's always the example. Given. Yeah, exactly. What we're seeing now, though, with the artificial intelligence focus is that there is such a fast-paced replacement of so many different types of jobs done by humans that we may have for the first time in, in at least modern history of the Western world, and of course now everything's tied together so you no longer reflect on just the Western world, but we're in the position where, in effect, we may, in, we may eliminate more jobs than we create. That's a question mark right now. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's so important for education to be able to help people not just be skilled in one thing, but begin to understand they're going to have to learn in a different way. They're going to have to learn to, emer to, to identify emerging weak signals. How do they impact potential mm -hmm. aspects of education, of politics, of economic development, or whatever? It's very true. And we see that right now in the coal industry. Coal, because primarily because of fracking, gas coming online, is a dying industry. There, years ago, you had 250,000 coal miners. Today, you got about 65,000 around the country, and you're going to have far fewer in the future. Coal is a dying industry. And this is one of those areas where the coal miners are going to have to be well prepared, going to have to be trained, they're going to have to be multidisciplinary, they're going to have to move into other areas, perhaps working in a solar a cell plant or something like that, where it's actually they'll make more money and it's a cleaner environment, they won't get black lung. But that that's one example of an industry that's changing very rapidly. Well, and what you're really, as I listen to you, and I now, I'll now listen to Connect. I used to listen to debate. I hate to admit that, okay? <laughs> But one of the things that, that you're getting at is that everything is tied together. So people that are in coal, we're moving toward a more solar oriented. We have a hiatus here at the time because of a political uh, administration that's focusing on, uh, and I think do, personally doing a disservice to having people believe you can go back. We're not going to be able to go back. Mm -hmm. And so that there will, be a, there will be an element of coal, but coal impacts climate change in a big way. Coal impacts then the capacity of a community to be able to, in effect, have an environment that is, that is uh, appropriate and clean and effective. It also, and I didn't realize this, Bill, until I really got into this in some depths uh, 20, and 10 and, uh, 20 and 30 years ago, even more so than the environment or the direct impact and loss in jobs, in my opinion, for the culture, for our culture, is it leads us to believe things that we, in effect, are comfortable with in the past will be able to that will be able to be used in the future, and so culturally we're in the process of a shift. And this is what John Cobb's talking about when he talks about ecological civilization. We really are in a so just like when we move from agricultural age to industrial age, and mm -hmm. industrial age has been around for 250 years, well, we're in the early stages, in my opinion, of moving to something totally different. Right. And it's scaring people to death, and that's one of the reasons you're seeing the political upheavals that we're seeing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Now, another term you use is master capacity <laughs> builder. Yeah. Master capacity builder. What is that, and what are some of the characteristic uh, characteristics of a master capacity builder? Well, it... It's a term that we coined about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is, is that there are two types of change. One type of change is what we call reforming change, whether you take an old idea and you enhance it, you improve it, you make it more efficient. The idea of the future emergence of new concepts and new approaches is that you do not have the skills and the talent and the capacities to be able to adapt quickly to a, to a type of a society and economy that's constantly mm -hmm. changing, uh, that you cannot predict the future. That's why I went back and gave you an example of 30 years ago, because mm, there, right. were, there were six or seven technologies that nobody knew about. You know, anything from, uh, from IT uh, to uh, the idea of the web to, to the concept of genomics, they were all in laboratories. Now they're impacting our total society. And so we're in the process of rethinking what we need to be able to prepare for a different kind of society and economy. And a part of this then gets at the idea of master capacity builds, a form of leadership that connects people, processes, and ideas that are truly transformative in a way that in turn will 
open up the possibilities of adapting and therefore that's why entrepreneurship is so important in this day and time mm -hmm. to, to not just look at what exists but say what may happen what if we did this mm -hmm. and there's so many technologies that I mentioned that are emerging now mm -hmm. that, now as you that move, are impacting our you know all aspects of our society exactly right as you move forward with this discussion mm -hmm. it, researching it in greater detail writing about it working through the narratives, unleashing the narratives for the 21st Century Project, what do you see as the major obstacles or challenges as you move forward? That's a great question, Bill. Uh, one is that we're, we want to do one thing. You know, the question is, what is the one answer? Right. What, what, is, what is the <laughs> right. thing we need to do? Well, in an age of systems, Systems move in different ways at different times in parallel with each other. Constantly in flux. Constantly in flux. And that's why biology is so important as opposed to physics in the sense. Both are important, but now we're moving to a more fluid biological type of society and economy. So that's one thing. The second thing is the knowledge base. We have got to upgrade and uplearn. The concept of uplearning is, is a new term that relates to the fact of not just dealing with old ideas, but really thinking through what needs to be done in specific ways and how do we apply it. Uh, people are scared. That's a third characteristic. People are scared. They want to have a comfort level. Where, where are we going to find our ability to, to raise our family and be able to fund our, mm -hmm. our society and our family? Uh, the ability to, to ask a appropriate question. I found it interesting. People are, are more at ease with statements that they make, you know, just to make a statement uh, of, a, of a, what they believe, and it may or may not be anything that relates to what's emerging. So we have to build capacities in local communities, organizations, and ourselves to be able to adapt to this, to this new world. Exactly. Now, as, before we run out of time, we were talking a, a bit about the unleashing a 21st century narrative. What other aspects of that would you like to share with our viewers today as far as what we need to focus upon to help us move further into this 21st century and to move into this adaptive planning? Well, the reason we came up with the idea of a meta-ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, is the idea that with the interaction of people, processes, and ideas worldwide, we're seeing just an immense shift in terms of not just what is changing, but the speed with which it's changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so our ability to be able to think about how do we prepare for this different kind of future, we believe the more people we can connect in terms of networks and then connect networks in a self-organizing way where people are always trying to connect with each other and asking questions and dealing with the future of education or economic development or whatever uh, in a way that's very appropriate. So, so the meta ecosystem for transformation then is a new concept that is getting at the idea of building two types, one an embedded meta ecosystem that have limits to it, that you can structure and say, uh, we, have, we have five different communities working in these, these arenas. Uh, there's also what we call unbounded ecosystems that I think is going to be more important. And that's where you build and just try to bring and connect people and processes and ideas together and just see where it goes, what emerges. Mm -hmm. And so the meta ecosystem is a new form of organization that is self-organizing that emerges and you need master capacity builders to help facilitate that kind of idea because it is more complex. Mm -hmm. But it also has more potential in terms of moving quicker and adapting mm -hmm. more easily. Very true. And of course, this is a very challenging time. It's a very frightening time to some degree, but it's one that's moving far beyond our control. And we have to understand it and we have to participate in it. We have to help set the agenda. As they say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that's exactly what we don't want to be. We want to be involved in this. And of course, you're doing great work focusing on this particular problem. But we're at the point in our society where we should be looking as to see how we can adapt, how we can change, how we can take advantage of this and not pit people, one group against another, not try to revert back to the, the industrial age with the 
the uh, the energy that was used back, you know, in the 1800s or something like that. There's so many things that we need to do. And, and Rick, I want to thank you so very much for helping move this discussion forward. But Rick Smyer, thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come up here and talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.